Welcome back to the audiobook on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel of Red Dwarf Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers. Happy to get back to this wonderful British sci fi comedy. And I'm happy to be talking to you guys in the comments. Phil commented on the last video saying, I am absolutely delighted to hear this series on your channel. Red Dwarf has been a show that seemed to follow me throughout my childhood, until it finally became apparent that I should fully enjoy it. I discovered it through bits and pieces, and then the audiobook surfaced. And finally, I got a chance to hear the whole story. Your version of this is amazing, and I appreciate you taking the time to read it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil, for your encouragement. I'm so glad that you're enjoying this, and that you love Red Dwarf with me. Red Dwarf certainly has been a part of my life since I was a child. My big brother was a very big fan of it. The show started before I was born, but was still going when I was around as a kid. So I've been watching this since I was in grade school, since probably before that. And it probably wasn't appropriate, but God damn it, I loved it. I'm so happy that some of the Fulcrum Knights have enjoyed this and have uh, been willing to share this book with me. Thank you so much, everyone who's listening. And now, let's continue with the book. Part 2, Chapter 10 Lister was having an argument with the dispensing machine when he heard the explosion. It was a simple dispute, and the dispensing machine was completely in the wrong. Lister had ordered his customary breakfast of prawn bangalore fowl, half rice, half chips, seven spicy poppadoms, a lager-flavoured milkshake, and two rennies. The machine had delivered a raspberry pavlova in onion gravy. There's something wrong with your voice recognition unit. Coming right up, said the dispensing machine, and served up two lightly grilled kippers. No, you don't understand. There's a malfunction somewhere. No problem at all, said the machine. Rare, medium, or well done. Then dispensed 43 pounds of raw calf's liver. Forget it, forget the food. Can you just give me a coffee? No sooner said than done, said the machine pleasantly. And a Christmas pudding, flambéed in brandy, rolled out of the dispensing hatch, onto the floor, and set fire to Lister's trouser bottoms. Lister was stamping out the Christmas pudding when the explosion rocked the ship. When he arrived breathless in the Navicomp chamber, Rimmer was staring, still in shock, at the drive panel. What was that? shouted Lister. Slowly, Rimmer turned his head and looked up. Brace yourself for a bit of a shock. I just saw you die. You saw what? Well, I did warn you to brace yourself. What? When? You didn't give me much of a chance. I gave you ample bracing time. No, you didn't. You didn't even pause. Well, I'm sorry. I just had a rather disturbing experience. I've just seen someone I know die in the most hideous way. Yeah? Me? It was horrible. Rimmer screwed up his face and shuddered in distaste. You are standing by the Navicomp. I don't want to know. You don't want to know how you die? No, of course I smeg and don't. Suddenly, the room seemed very dark and cold to Lister. Was it quick? he asked quietly. Well, I wouldn't say it was super fast. Not if you count that thrashing around and the agonising squealing. He shuddered again. You're enjoying this, aren't you? What a horrible thing to say. It was definitely me. Yep, Rimmer grinned. I don't want to know about this. He sucked absently at one of his locks. How old did I look? How old are you now? Twenty-five. How old did I look? I'd say... Rimmer clicked his tongue. Mid-twenties? Smeg! Lister got up and kicked the Navicomp. I'm not ready! He kicked it again. I'm not smegging ready! Yes, you did seem surprised. Especially when the arm came off. So you saw my face. You got a good look at my face. It was actually me. It was my face. Yes. You were wearing your stupid leather deerstalker and the furry earmuffs. Lister snatched off his leather deerstalker with the furry earmuffs. Okay, I'll never wear a hat. I'll never wear it again. Then it can't happen. 
He flung the cap across the Navicomp, and it scudded along the floor. Rimmer smiled. But it has happened. You can't change it any more than you can change what you had for breakfast this morning. But it hasn't happened, has it? It has, will be, have going to happen, but it hasn't actually happened, happened. The point of it is, it has happened. It just hasn't taken place yet. Lister stared blankly into space, playing with his hair, while Rimmer tried to wrestle back the smirk that was making a break for his face. All right. All right, okay, okay, the cat. Right. Lister got to his feet. The cat broke his tooth in a future echo, right? I'm listening. If I can stop him breaking it, can't be done. Then I can stop me from dying. Can't be done, unfortunately. So, how would the cat break his tooth? Lister sat quietly, tugging at a loose piece of rubber on the toe cap of his boot. Rimmer watched him, whistling a Dixieland jazz version of Death March in Saul. Eating something. Can't be done, old buckaroo, your number is up. Eating something hard. Can't be done a need, sadly. Lister stood up, his eyes alive, and pelted out of the Navicomp chamber. Where are you going? Rimmer got to his feet. My goldfish! Lister's voice echoed from the corridor. He's trying to eat my robot goldfish! Plop. Cur plop. Plop. The cat lay listlessly on Rimmer's bunk. Several of his shirts were slung on a line across the sleeping quarters, dripping noisily into receptacles. He hated laundry day. It always made him tired. Wearily, he picked up another dirty shirt, unfurled his tongue, and started cleaning it with long, methodical, rough, wet licks, stopping occasionally to top up his tongue with washing-up powder. When it was finished, he hung the shirt on the line with the others. Plop, ker, plop, plop. He really didn't feel like attacking his sock pile right now, so he got up and started mooching around the quarters, looking for something else to do. He picked up a book from Rimmer's shelf and ran his nose across one or two of the pages, but he couldn't make any sense of it. It appeared to be covered in funny little blobs, which didn't smell of anything. Cats didn't communicate by writing. They communicated by smell. To read a piece of cat literature, you ran your nose along a line, which released various impregnated scents from the page. There were 246 smell symbols in the cat lexicon. Each could be qualified by smaller, subtler smells, which altered the meaning. Symbols could also mean completely different things in different contexts. For instance, the smell of fear in a different setting could also mean very bad, noxious, toilet, or sometimes even estate agent. The cat decided to amuse himself by trying to read the contents of Lister's dirty laundry basket. Much to his surprise, some of it translated quite well into cat prose. In fact, one t-shirt contained a sentence about a fearful, very bad estate agent going to a noxious toilet. Then he noticed the goldfish. He watched them for a while. One of them was swimming backwards. He'd never actually seen a live fish, but he was aware of some primal instinct they stirred deep within his stomach. Even though he'd eaten less than an hour ago, he found a little hunger pain squeaking, Let's eat the fish! He had a small, half-hearted dialogue with the hunger pain, but it was fairly insistent. Come on, let's eat the fish! I'm not hungry. Eat it! Eat it! Come on! The cat put his hand into his jacket pocket, pulled out an already buttered roll. He usually kept one handy. He began his food ritual by singing mockingly at the snack. I'm gonna eat your little fishy. I'm gonna eat your little fishy. I'm gonna eat your little fishy. Cause I like eating fish. To give the fish a fighting chance, he stood with his back to them. Then 
In a single movement, he swiveled round, flicked one of the fish out of the tank with the back of his hand, and caught it in the bread roll. Too slow, little fishy, he chided his goldfish sandwich. Too slow for this cat. He raised the squirming roll to his mouth and started to bite down through the bread. No! screamed Lister. The cat half turned and saw Lister flying towards him like a berserk caber, his face contorted, his mouth forming a distorted elliptical O. No! The cat was still smiling, in anticipation of his fishy nibble, when Lister crashed into him. They smacked into the table and stumbled onto the hard grey deck. The fish roll skidded across the floor. Lister sprang off the softly moaning cat, grabbed the roll and looked inside. McCartney was still wriggling away, intact, unbitten. I did it, Lister said quietly. I did it! He screamed not so quietly. I did it! I got the fish! I'm not gonna die! He did a victory dance, like a zero-G ceiling receiver who just scored the winning touch-up. Rimmer stood in the doorway. The cat clambered to his feet. Mad tooth! He put a handkerchief to his mouth. It came away bloody. You're crazy! Lister came towards him. Let me see! The cat raced out of the sleeping quarters. Mad tooth! Mad tooth! He was yelling. I think I lost my tooth! Lister stared at the floor, at the small piece of white enamel that was lying under the chair, taunting him. A one-toothed grin. Well, Rimmer's smirk was as big as Yankee Stadium. Allow me to be the very first to offer my deepest commiserations. Rimmer there, being an utter prick. This future Echoes plotline of the book does bring in uh, some classic ideas of sci-fi and some true kind of deep philosophical questions about fate. Time travel has worked quite differently in a lot of different kind of formats. How do you guys feel about the time travel here? This obviously being tied distinctly to uh, the speed of light and time being a physical thing that is in turn affected by gravity and as light is also affected by gravity, so is time. That's what I've been told. I don't understand any of that because I'm a dumb, dumb, stupid man. Um, but uh, I do love uh, try and travel. I love like the different versions of it throughout sci-fi. How do you guys feel about this one? And Omar, good to see you in the comments, says, This is my first time experiencing Red Dwarf and I love Cat already. I can just imagine an army of stylishly dressed soldiers fighting one another and pausing every half hour or so to get clean from the fighting. I absolutely agree, they'd have camouflage that's perfectly colour coordinated, and as Omar says, with new patterns for every season, no pattern being the same on any uniform, yet they all appear uniforms regardless. The Cat is wonderful, a product of a fun sci-fi idea and just plain funny stuff. And now on to part 2, chapter 11. Lister spun off the bottle of Glen Fujiyama, Japan's finest malt whiskey, and poured a generous measure into a pint mug. Rimmer lay on his bunk, whistling pleasantly, his hologrammatic eyes a twinkle. Every opportunity he got, he tried to catch Lister's eye and wink at him cheerily. Lister took a gulp of whiskey. You're loving this, aren't you? Oh, you're still not going on about your impending death, are you? For heaven's sake! He put on a fake Scouse accent. Change the record. Flip the channel. Death isn't the handicap it once was. For Smeg's sake, cheer up. You are, aren't you? You're loving it. Holly, I'd like to send an internal memo. Black Border. Begins. To Dave Lister. Condolences on your imminent death. Rimmer half closed his eyes. What's that? poem. Ah, yes. Now, weary traveller, rest your head, for just like me, you'll soon be dead. You're really sick, you know that? Come on! 
Rimmer made the O in on last three full seconds. It's all you ever talk about. Frankly, Lister, it's very boring. You are. You're loving it. You're obsessed. You realise when I die, you're going to be on your own. Can't wait. I thought you didn't want that. I thought that's what you were bleating on about before. No. What got me down before wasn't being on my own. It was the idea that you were doing so much better than me. Staying young and being alive. It was all too much to take. Now, me old buckaroo, the caliper's on the other foot. Lister gave up trying to argue. It was just adding to Rimmer's pleasure. I remember my grandmother used to say, there's always some good in every situation. Absolutely, absolutely, agreed Rimmer. And looking on the bright side in this particular situation, you are about to do the largest splits you've ever done in your life. So I get blown up, right? Bits of you do. What's that thing? I think it's part of your digestive system. The long purpley thing with the knobbly bits. You only ever see them hanging in Turkish butcher's shops. Well, whatever it is, that fair flies across the Navacomp chamber. It was like a sort of wobbly boomerang. Smeg off. Temper. I don't want to die. Well, neither did I. But it's not fair. There's so much I haven't done. Lister started to think about all the things he hadn't done. For some reason, one of the first things that came to his mind was the fact that he'd never had a king prawn biryani. Whenever he'd seen it on the menu, he'd always played safe and ordered chicken or lamb. Now, he would never have a king prawn biryani. And books! There were so many he'd meant to read but hadn't found the time. I've never read! I've never read! Actually, when he thought about it, he realised he'd never read any book. It wasn't that he didn't like literature, it was just that generally he waited for the film to come out. And a family. He'd always assumed one day he'd have a family. A real family, not an adopted one. A real one. And he'd always wanted to spend a lot of time doing the thing you had to do if you wanted to get a family. He hadn't done nearly enough of that. Not nearly enough. A lot, but not nearly enough. He was dimly aware that Rimmer was speaking, and Lister grunted occasionally to give the impression he was listening, but he wasn't. He was remembering his old job back on Earth. His old job parking shopping trolleys at Sainsbury's Mega Market, built on the site of the old Anglican Cathedral. One time, the manager had caught him asleep in the warehouse. He'd constructed a little bed out of bags of salt, hidden from view behind a wall of canned pilchards. The manager had two GCSEs, a company car, and a trainee moustache. He'd lectured Lister for an hour about how, if he applied himself, within five years he could be a manager himself, with a company car and, presumably, a trainee moustache. On the other hand, the trainee moustache warned him if he didn't apply himself, he'd be parking shopping trolleys for the rest of his natural life. Lister, who knew he was no genius, also knew for absolute certain he was 147 times smarter than the manager. Nonetheless, he found this pep talk extraordinarily disturbing. He knew he didn't want to spend all his life parking shopping trolleys, and equally he couldn't get excited about becoming stock control manager at Sainsbury's megastore, Hope Street, Liverpool. The manager took him by the lapels and shook him. He told Lister he had to make the grade and become an SCM or his life would never amount to shit. And now he was sat there knowing he'd probably only got a few hours to live. It occurred to him, for the first time ever, that the pompous goit with the trainee moustache would probably turn out to be right. And that hurt. That really hurt. And that was how he spent most of the evening, tugging at the whiskey bottle, reviewing his crummy life. And it wasn't the mistakes he made that haunted him. It was the mistakes he hadn't got round to making. He flicked through the catalogue of missed opportunities and unfulfilled promises. 
He thought about the magnificently unlikely string of coincidences which had brought him into being. The Big Bang, the universe, life on Earth, mankind, the zillions to one chance of the particular egg and sperm combination which created him. It had all happened. And what had he done with this incredible good fortune? He'd treated time like it was urine and pissed it all away into a big empty pot. But no, it wasn't true. He'd had triumphs. A little voice from the whiskey bottle was telling him. He'd been at the Superdome that night in London when the Jets played the Berlin Bandits in the European Divisional Playoffs and when Jim Bexley Speed, the greatest player ever to wear the roof attack jersey, had the greatest game of his great career. He'd seen that famous second score when Speed had gone round nine men, leaving the commentators totally speechless for the first time in history for fully nine seconds. That was a triumph. Just being there. He was alive and there that night. How many men could say that? Then there was that time at the Indiana takeaway in St. John's Precinct when he'd tasted his first chamois kebab and become hopelessly and irrevocably hooked on this Indian hors d'oeuvre. True. He dedicated a good deal of the rest of his life searching for another truly perfect chamois kebab. And true, he'd never found one. But at least he'd tasted one. One food of the gods, perfect chamois kebab. How many men could say that? And then there was KK. True, they'd only dated for five weeks, and that last week had been a bit sour. But four weeks of Christine Kachansky being madly in love with him. Christine Kachansky, who was so beautiful she could probably have got a job on the perfume counter at Lewis's. And she'd fallen in love with him. For four weeks. Four whole weeks. How many men could say that? Not that many, probably. And that night, in the air birth arms, when he played pool... That night when, for some unknown reason, everything he tried came off. The goddess of barroom pool looked down from the heavens and blessed his cue. Every shot, tick, straight into the back of the pocket. They couldn't get him off the table. He was unbeatable. Three and a half hours, seventeen consecutive wins. He became a legend. He never played pool again because he knew. He wasn't that good. But that night, in the Aberth Arms, he became a legend. A legend of the Aberth Arms. How many men could say that? The whiskey bottle clanked emptily against the rim of his glass. He drank half a bottle of whiskey in two hours. How many men could say that? He was drunk. How many men could say that? He fell asleep in the chair. How many men could say that? At three in the morning, he was woken up by Holly. Emergency. There's an emergency going on. It's still going on, and it's an emergency. Rimmer sat up in bed, his hologrammatic hair pointing stupidly in every compass direction. What is it? The Navicomps crashed. I can't cope with the influx of data at light speed. We've got to hook it up to the drive computer and make a bypass. Lister slung his legs over the bunk. The Navicomp! The Navicomp in the Navicomp chamber! If we don't fix it, the ship will blow up in about 15 minutes and 23 seconds. Lister jumped down to the floor. Well, this is it then? Rimmer looked at him. Don't go! What do you mean, don't go? You said yourself, I can't avoid it. Let's get it over with. What was I wearing? Your leather deerstalker and that grey t-shirt. Lister pulled on his deerstalker with deliberate precision. Then he walked across to the wash basin and lifted the metal towel rail off its support. Well, let's go. What's that for? Lister patted the towel rail against his left palm. I'm going out like I came in, screaming and kicking. You can't whack death on the head. If he comes near me, I'll rip his nipples off. Then he was gone.
Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That, if he comes near me, I'll rip his nipples off, is one of my favourite lines of the show. It is, it is a beautiful one. Going out like I came in, screaming and kicking. Uh, it's a very good line with a Scouse accent. You get a lot of the k- and that's, a, that's an interesting part of the Scouse accent, is the way that uh, hard consonants like C's and K's work. Also, how you pronounce uh, an oo sound or an uh sound, so double O's. So let's say you and I would say book, book. And you get some Scouse that go, all right, I'm reading the book. Yeah, this is me book. But my grandparents um, were Scousers who, you read books? All right, what's that? What's that book you're reading there, Harry? All right, you're reading that book for school, are you? Is that a cookbook? Was that a cookbook? Because sometimes you get people who do both. Someone who say, uh, they might say cook, but they might say book. They might say cookbook or a cookbook or a cookbook. If you're ever in the UK or you are already, my friends, I always recommend Liverpool as a destination. It may be not the prettiest of cities at times, but it is a place that I utterly, utterly love. And a huge amount of that is the people. And before I read the next chapter, I just want to say thanks very much to Gooch, who said uh, that he might share this with some friends who might enjoy it. I really appreciate that so much. It's such a thoughtful thing for you to do. Thank you so much. And anyone out there listening who thinks that their friends might enjoy some uh, old 80s sci-fi comedy, please do let them know about the videos. And now here is part two, chapter 12. The Navicomp chamber was fogged with acrid smoke from the melted insulating wires, and a thick cable swung from the ceiling, jumping and sparking like a dying electric python. A manic, high-pitched screeching from the wounded navigation computer rose and fell as around the perimeter of the chamber monitor screens popped and shattered one by one. Lister, his eyes streaming, fumbled for the bypass unit strapped to the wall, and, following Holly's shouted instructions, dragged it across the broken glass and hooked it up to the main terminal. He opened the bypass casing. Inside were twelve switches. Start at the one numbered twelve, Holly was yelling, and leave a one-second gap between each switch. He closed his eyes and rested his finger on the twelfth switch. He flicked it down. The pitch of the wailing Navicomp increased by an octave. A green light flickered on beside the number 12. He moved his fingers across to the 11th switch. Click. Eeeeeee! Another octave higher. A green light. The 10th switch. Click. The console monitor above Lister's head exploded and vomited shards of glass into the smoke. Another green light. The switch numbered nine. Another green light. Eight. Then seven. And that was halfway. Number six. Click. A red light. Turn it off, Holly said. Turn it off before... Lister flicked it off, waited, and flicked it back on. He Green. Five to go. A maximum of five seconds before his purple knobbly thing was destined to fly across the room. Click. 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 Just two left. Two little switches. Blister wanted it to happen now. The penultimate switch. He didn't want to have to flick on the last one knowing. Knowing it would be the one to kill him. He wanted to have the slight element of surprise but he was disappointed. Click. Green light. Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
and a third. And Lister realised it was his heartbeat. He sucked deeply at the foul, smoke-laden air. It tasted good. And for the second time in twenty-four hours, he did the touch-up shuffle. His feet rooted to the spot, he swayed from his waist and moved his arms in counter-motion. He was alive! Ah, oh, happy ending there to uh, chapter 12. All right, okay, so that future that we saw, was it something that he could avoid? Or was it perhaps that that future wasn't exactly what Rimmer thought it was? I think something that I noticed about these books is that uh, a lot of Red Dwarf is about sort of Lister being in quite dark situations and getting through. And it's about that kind of like ability to sort of maintain your humanity and sort of, you know, some semblance of humour and happiness even in terrible circumstances, I think. I think it's about having fun with that. Um, although sometimes it's it gets a bit dark. But very happy to see Lister alive and dancing. And talking about things when they are dark, uh, Inspector Lovecraft uh, says, Night Shift Gang Represent. So glad to get another part loving this audiobook. Thank you very much, Inspector Lovecraft. I'm really glad that you're enjoying this. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be sharing this with people again. All right, part two, chapter 13. The Red Dwarf Central Line tube hissed to a halt, and Lister danced out onto the platform. He had a sudden urge for chocolate. White milk chocolate, which he hadn't had since he was a kid. So he slipped a fifty-penny-cent bit into the machine and tugged on the drawer. But the drawer was stuck. For some reason, this filled him with delight. The drawers were always stuck on station platform chocolate machines. Some things don't change. He laughed too much, then jumped on the escalator and leapt three steps at a time to catch up with Rimmer. They stood on the escalator. Every advert they passed, Lister sang the advertising jingle. I don't know why you're so chirpy. I'm alive! But it's going to happen. I saw it happen. It just hasn't happened when we thought it would happen. Who cares? The point is, it hasn't happened. Correction, it has happened. It just hasn't happened yet. Don't let's get into that again. Lister, I saw it. I saw you die. It was you. I am sure it was you. What about the photograph? The two babies? That hasn't happened yet. Maybe none of it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's really browning you off, isn't it? That I haven't died yet. The escalator pushed them off at the top. Lister leapt over the turnstile barrier and Rimmer walked through it. No, it's not that. It's just your dunderheaded refusal to accept the pointless cruelty of existence. That's what gets my goat. Lister shook his head sadly. When they walked into the sleeping quarters, an old man was lying on Lister's bunk. When he smiled, his age lines crinkled like wrapping paper. He raised his robotic left arm. The hand was a metallic prosthesis, but the little finger had been customised so its top joint was a bottle opener. He used it to flick open a bottle of self-heating sake and took a healthy swig. His white hair was plaited into three-foot-long locks and his right eye was missing. In its place was a telephoto lens which zoomed and clicked and focused in unison with his good eye. And it was quite clear the old man was Lister. He looked towards the door but didn't appear to see them. The watch on the future Echo's good right arm emitted a series of squeaks. He turned it off and smiled. Lister made out a curious tattoo on his future self's forearm. It appeared to be burned into the flesh. Some kind of formula. It was fading, but it looked like U equals B-I-L. Lister was craning closer to read it when the old man spoke. So, you're here, he said, Lister's voice with a slight quaver. I can't see you, and I can't hear you, but I know you're here. Rimmer, you're going to say it's impossible. It is impossible, said Rimmer. I saw you die. The old man looked more or less in Lister's direction. 
Hello, Dave. This is me. I mean, you. I mean, I am you. I mean, I am you as an old man. And I know you're here, because when I was your age, I saw me at my age telling you at your age what I'm about to tell you. And you've got to tell you too, when you get to be me. Well, said Rimmer, thank heavens you've still got all your marbles. The person you saw die, Rimmer, was Bexley's son. Rimmer frowned. Well, who's Bexley? I was always going to call my second son Bexley, said Lister. After Jim Bexley Speed. Dave, it wasn't you that Rimmer saw in the Navacomp chamber. It was Bexley's boy. It was your grandson. Lister sat heavily into a chair. It was too much to take in. He wasn't going to die in the Navacomp accident. He was going to have a son, who was also going to have a son. And so his son's son would die. You have two sons, the old Lister was saying, and six grandchildren. But one of them dies. Everyone dies, said the old Lister. You're born, you die. The bit in between is called life. And you have all those times together still to come. Enjoy. He smiled. The old man's watch went off again. I haven't got much time. Get your camera and go to the medical unit. What at the medical unit? Lister fumbled in his locker for his camera. Lister's older self began to grow translucent. What about me? Rimmer walked up to the bunk. What happens to me? He can't hear us, Rimmer. He's from the future. Ah, but if I ask you what happens to me now, you'll remember it, and when you get to be him, you'll be able to tell me. Brutal? Lister grabbed the camera from his vacuum storage trunk and raced out. Don't waste time! Run! The old Lister called after him. What happens to me, old man? Do I become an officer? Do I ever get a body again? Do we get back to Earth? The old man took another swig of sake and turned unseeing through Rimmer's imploring face. Oh, Rimmer, he said suddenly. You wanted to know what happened to you? Yes, what happened to me? Come close, the old Lister beckoned. Come close, closer. Rimmer inclined his ear to the old man's mouth. You wanted to know your future? Yes, please. Rimmer whispered reverently and stood on tiptoe so his ear hovered barely millimetres from the future Echo's mouth. The old Lister breathed in deeply, then belched loudly into Rimmer's ear. He was still laughing when he vanished. Rimmer caught up with Lister just outside the medical unit. Lister was hastily fitting an Instafilm into the camera. A jolt rocked the ship, and Lister went crashing against a wall, dropping the film. Smeg in hell! He picked it up and fumbled it into the camera. Smeg, it was upside down! Holly flicked up on the wall monitor. Deceleration achieved. We're slowing down, dudes. We'll be below light speed in 35 seconds precisely. What's going to happen now? Are we going to see my funeral or something? No, we're decelerating now said Holly. The faster we're going, the more into the future the future echoes were. But since we've just started slowing down, the future echoes should get nearer to the present. A baby started crying. Then another baby started crying. Standing in the doorway of the medical unit was another Lister, more or less the same age Lister was now. He was wearing a white surgical gown and in his arms were two babies wrapped in silver thermal blankets. I can't see you and all that guff, Lister's future echo said, but I'd like you to meet your twin sons. This is Jim and this is Bexley. Lister brought them into focus in the viewfinder and rested his finger on the camera's trigger. Say cheese, boys. The future echo struck a pose and grinned. The two babies wailed louder than ever. Click. The future echoes faded away. 
The camera ejected the quick pick, and an image of Lister, holding two babies in silver blankets, slowly coloured into focus. Lister turned and started to walk back to the sleeping quarters. Rimmer followed him. How are you supposed to get two babies when we don't have a woman on board? I don't know, Lister grinned. But it's going to be a lot of fun finding out. And there ends chapter 13 and the mystery of the future echoes, but it has left us only with further mysteries. One thing that I find funny about that chapter is uh, the, the camera that Lister's using at the end there, which uh, is essentially like a Polaroid. Um, I think in the TV show it is, it is basically a Polaroid camera um, that he uses. And it's one of the things that I love about this book is that it is a sci-fi book where humanity has started to conquer space. We have colonized, it seems, the entire solar system. So we are an interplanetary species. And yet apparently, according to this book, we didn't figure out digital photography. Something I thought about in a very early uh, episode where Peterson mentions that you can't take a photograph on a methane atmosphere planet, which would imply they're still using physical film. In the TV show, they do it kind of funnier. There's an episode where they get movies on um, like these VHS cassettes, and the only thing that indicates they are like VHS cassettes of the future is that they're triangles instead of rectangles. Quick shout out to Skylar, who says, Sick man, I really like the last three parts. A shame I've never heard of Red Dwarf before. Well, uh, never fear, there is lots of Red Dwarf out there. So if you can find a way to watch the show or uh, read any of the books or any of the other official audiobooks, there is plenty for you to enjoy. And I hope you like it. Okay, part two, chapter 14, is going to get into... One of my favourite bits of Red Dwarf. We still have a character missing from our cast, our regular cast, and we are about to discover that character, and he, he is a wonderful one. So this is part two, chapter 14. Captain Yvette Richards ran her fingers through the bristles of her crew cut and craned forward to look at the spectroscope of the sun they were approaching. It was perfect. She let out a Texan yelp. We got it! Flight coordinator Elaine Schumann leaned over her shoulder and peered at the console. It's a supergiant? You betcha, said Richards, and yelped again. Time to celebrate, said Schumann. Crichton, the service mechanoid, handed round styrofoam cups of dehydrated champagne and topped them up with water. The eight woman two-man crew yelped and cheered and partied, while Crichton handed round more champagne and irradiated caviar niblets, which he'd been saving especially. It had taken the crew of Nova 5 six months to find a blue supergiant, a star teetering on the edge of its final phase in the right quadrant of the right galaxy. Another month, and they would have ruined the whole campaign. They certainly felt they had a good reason to celebrate. Sipping her champagne, Kirsty Fantosi, the star demolition engineer, started programming the Nebulon missile. It had to explode at just the right moment to trigger off the reaction in the star's core, which could push it into supernova stage. A star in supernova would light up the entire galaxy for over a month giving off more energy than the Earth's sun could in ten billion years. It would be a hell of a bang. One undetected bug in Fantosi's programming could ruin everything. Not only did she have to push the star into supernova, she had to time it so the light from the explosion would reach Earth at exactly the right moment. The right moment? was the same moment as the light from the other 127 supergiants, which were also being induced into supernovae, reached Earth. For anyone living on Earth, the result would be mind-fizzlingly spectacular. 128 stars would appear to go supernova simultaneously, burning with so much ferocity that they would be visible even in daylight and the 128 supernovae would spell out a message. And this would be the message. Coke adds life. For five whole weeks, 
the huge tattoo would be branded across the day and night skies. Honeymooners in Hawaii would stand on the peak of Mauna Kea, gazing at the sunset stamped with the slogan. Commuters in London, stuck in traffic jams, would peer through the grey drizzle and gape at the Kola constellation. The few primitive tribes still untouched by civilization in the jungles of South America would look up at the heavens and certainly not think about drinking Pepsi. The cost of this single three-word ad in star writing across the universe would amount to the entire military budget of the USA for the whole of history. So ridiculous though it was, it was still a marginally more sensible way of blowing trillions of dollar pounds. And the Coke executives were assured by the advertising executives at Saatchi, 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 Saatchi and Saatchi, it would put an end to the cola war forever. Guaranteed, Pepsi would be buried. OK, it wasn't wonderful, ecologically speaking. OK, it involved the destruction of 128 stars, which otherwise would have lasted another 25 million years or so. OK, when the stars exploded, they would gobble up three or four planets in each of their solar systems, and OK, the resulting radiation would last long past the lifetime of our own planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it sure as hell would sell a lot of cans of a certain fizzy drink. Fantosi finished the program and fired the Nebulon missile off into the heart of the star. She finished her styrofoam cup of champagne and flicked on her intercom. Let's turn this son of a goit around and go home. The nose cone of Nova 5 slowly swung around to begin the jag back to Earth. The seven crew members who were in stasis didn't survive the crash. As the ship bellied onto the cratered surface of the ice-clad moon, it caught the edge of a jagged precipice which ripped open the port side like a key on a sardine can, and the stasis ease spilled out into the deadly methane atmosphere. Captain Richards, who'd taken the first three months' watch along with Schumann and Fantosi, had been playing solo squash when Crichton had dropped into the leisure suite to inform her politely that the ship's steering system had gone all cockamamie and the computer had gone doolally. She raced up to the drive room to find chaos. The computer was reciting 15th century French poetry and the steering system was on fire. What in hell is happening? Etoilette, je tout vois, the computer said soothingly. Crichton sprayed the steering system with a portable extinguisher. I don't understand what's going on, Miss Yvette. Schumann? Fantosi? Richards barked into the intercom. Get in here, we're in deep smeg. It's a complete mystery, said Crichton. Que la lune très d'assois. One minute he was fine, Crichton shook his head. The next he was acting like this. Richards tore at the panel housing to engage the backup computer. Nicolette is avec toi. I mean, if I'd known he was going to go mad on us, I wouldn't have bothered cleaning him. Say what, Crichton? I mean, what is the point of treating him to a complete spring clean, polishing all his bits and bobs with beeswax and scrubbing his terminals with soapy water, if he is going to go all peculiar? You clean the computer? What? Can't you tell? He's absolutely sparkling. Just look inside. Richards peered into the computer's circuit board casing. Foaming, soapy water bubbled and smoked beneath the gleaming, newly polished innards. Mamiette, elle est bonne de poil. The computer gurgled and blew soap bubbles out of his voice simulation unit. Crichton, did you clean the backup computer too? Crichton looked away modestly. Did you, Crichton? Please, uh, Miss Yvette, I don't want thanks. Did you? She grabbed him roughly by his shoulders. 
The only thanks I need is knowing that you appreciate a job well done. His lipless mouth twisted into a plastic grin. Schumann burst into the drive room, wearing a towel, rat tails of wet hair bouncing behind her. What's happening? Fantosi raced past her and up to the fizzling flight console. Her eyes darted over the digital readouts. She typed quickly on the old-fashioned five-button keyboard. There's no way in! She tried again. We can't get manual! The flight console won't let us in! Well, it should be working 110%, Crichton said. It's even cleaner than the computers. Nova 5 dug a a three-and-a-half-mile smoking furrow like a giant twisted grin on the icy surface of the moon, and finally came to rest in two separate pieces at the bottom of a mountain range. The red-hot metal of the hull screamed and hissed, warped and twisted in the cruel suddenness of its icy bath. Gradually, it stopped protesting, and with a sigh, surrendered to its final resting place. Silence. Crichton looked down at his legs. They were thirty feet away, at the other end of the drive room. Nova 5 tilted like a dry ski slope. He dragged his torso down the incline, over to the body of Yvette Richards. Blood pumped from a gash in her thigh, and her leg was twitching involuntarily. She was breathing. Just. Crichton looked down at the mess of wires that were hanging out of the end of his torso. He located one he didn't need very much, yanked it out, and tied it in a tourniquet round the top of her thigh. Richard's eyes blinked open. Is everyone okay? Fantosi was groaning under a pile of debris. Crichton hauled his half-body to the mound of twisted metal and started pulling her out. Both her legs were broken. Crichton made rudimentary splints out of his hip rods and bound them with wires torn from his midriff. Thanks, Crichton. Her mouth split into a dry smile. Then she passed out. Schumann crawled in from the corridor. Her ankle twisted almost backwards, with cuts on her face and hands. Hey, Richards, she grinned. Nice landing. Remind me never to lend you my car. Crichton lugged what was left of himself over to Schumann and, without warning, snapped her twisted ankle back into place. She screamed and punched him in the head. We've lost the others. Richards was looking at the security cameras. And half the ship. We've still got the stores and the medical unit. And since we're all breathing, we can assume the atmosphere generator is still operational and the crash seal held. I guess Crichton hadn't got round to cleaning that yet. We'd better get you all down to the medical unit, said Crichton. Excuse me, Miss Elaine, would you be so kind as to pass me my legs? And so we have met Crichton, a very important character in the future. Crichton, an utter fan favourite from Red Dwarf. I love him. The actor who plays him, Robert Llewellyn, is wonderful. He was on a show that I also loved um, called Scrap Heap Challenge. I think you guys uh, in the States have a version of that too, where a bunch of people go into a junkyard and they have to build some sort of machine um, and they are paired off against another team. I'm so pleased to have Crichton in the book finally. I've just spotted a comment that I should have read out before uh, when we had the, the two children. Lister's sons, because Matches Malone commented saying, My sons, Hey Hey and Gilby. Which I think is uh, these some cute baby names for me and Gilbs, but that's fun. Um, and yes, yes, sure, Matches. Maybe you're our future papa, or we're your future children, and this is all a weird future echo, and these audiobooks haven't happened yet. I don't really understand how it works. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be the last chapter of this video. Thank you very much for everyone listening and for carrying on with this story with me. This is part two, chapter 15. Holly was lost. When he'd finally managed to wrestle Red Dwarf down to below light speed, he'd found a small electric blue moon with suitable gravity, plunged into its orbit, and performed the 180-degree slingshot manoeuvre needed to turn the ship around. But now... He was lost. The thing about being in deep space is the universe looks 
exactly the same from wherever you are. It's sort of a gigantic version of the Barbican Centre. And although they were now supposed to be on a course heading back to Earth, Holly wasn't totally 100% convinced his calculations were absolutely right on the button correct. There are two ways to cope when you're lost. The first way, to get out a map. Discover where you are, work out where you want to go and plot a route accordingly. The second method was the method Holly was using. Uh, Basically, you keep on going, hoping that sooner or later you'll come across a familiar landmark and muddle through from there. So far, nothing had looked very familiar. Occasionally, he spotted a constellation he thought they may have passed before, but he couldn't swear to it. And every so often, they passed the odd multi-ringed gas giant with a red spot at the pole. But, frankly... Multi-ringed gas giants with red spots at their poles were ten a penny. On his way out of the solar system, all those years ago, he'd started to compile what he'd hoped would be the definitive A to Z of the universe. With galaxies, planets, star systems, street names and everything. But he'd fallen behind in the last couple of millennia. He lost his heart in the whole project. It was the same with his diary. Each year he began to log the events of the voyage in eloquent detail, but every year, by January the 13th, he'd generally forgotten to keep it up, and the rest of the diary just comprised a few important birthdays. His creators, his own, Netta Muscat's, and Kevin Keegan's. And the only reason he included Kevin Keegan's was to remind himself not to send him a card, because he'd written, Football, It's a Funny Old Game. So, until he spotted a star, or a planet he recognised, Holly amused himself by devising a system totally to revolutionise music. He decided to decimalise it. Instead of the octave, it became the decative. He invented two new notes, H and J. Holly practised his new scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, wo, bo, ti, do. <laughs> Fuck me. I tried. It sounded good. He tried it in reverse. Now, fuck that, I'm not doing that. Do, ti, bo, wo, la, so, fa, bi, re, do. It would be a whole new sound. Hull rock. All the instruments would have to be extra large to incorporate the two new notes. Triangles with four sides. Piano keyboards the length of zebra crossings. The only drawback as far as Holly could see was that women would have to be banned from playing the cello unless they had birthing stirrups or elected to play it side saddle. The exercise in restructuring the eighth note musical scale helped keep his mind off a number of major perturbations. One of these was that they were running worryingly low of a number of major supplies which had been consumed by cat kind during Lister's stay in stasis. Checking the supply list was a bit like opening a bank statement. Sometimes when you're feeling good and things are going well, you can take the news, even though you know it's going to be hideous. Other times most of the time, that bank statement can stay unopened for weeks. The ranks of figures lurk inside the missive like warped hobgoblins, evil, deranged, waiting to leap out and suck out your life force. Pandora's box in an envelope. That's pretty much how Holly felt about the ship's inventory. The last time he'd mustered enough courage to take a peek, he'd discovered some goose-pimpling shortages. Although they had enough food to last 50,000 years, they'd completely run out of shaken vac. They had little fruit, few green vegetables, very little yeast, and only one after-eight mint, which he was sure no one would eat because they'd all be too polite to take it. So, to take his mind off the problem, Holly began singing his first decorative composition. Quartet for nine players in H-sharp minor. 
he just reached the solo for a trombone player with three lungs when the incoming message reached the ship's scanning system. Lister realised he couldn't possibly go into stasis, on the grounds that the future echoes of himself had told him that he didn't, he decided he wouldn't, and instead he tried to make the best of a difficult situation. While he waited for the babies to show up, whenever and however that was, he elected to have some fun. He'd found a jet-powered space bike in the docking bay and was overhauling it with a view to go on a joyride through the asteroid belt. With a rag soaked in white spirit, he sat on his bunk methodically cleaning the greasy machine parts which were scattered all over his duvet, while Rimmer paced up and down the metal-grilled floor of the sleeping quarters. Mies paras que quiam vivenos la vetero estes melda, said the language instructor on the vid screen, and left a pause for the translation. Rimmer paced. Um, ah, uh, um, wait a minute, I know this. Oh, uh, hang on, don't tell me. Um. Without looking up from the jet manifold he was fervently greasing, Lister chimed. I hope when you come, the weather will be clement. I hope when you come, the weather will be clement, the woman on the vid disc concurred. Don't tell me! I would have got that! Bon volu directi min kinstvela otello, the recorded instructor prompted. Ah, yes, this is one from last time. I remember this. Oh! Lister took the screwdriver out of his mouth. Please could you direct me to a five-star hotel? Wrong, actually. Totally, completely and utterly, totally wrong. Please could you direct me, the instructor said, to a five-star hotel. Lister, would you please shut up? I'm just helping you. I don't need any help. Rimmer had decided to put his demise behind him and vowed to make his death as rich and fulfilling as was humanly possible. And so he had taken up again his Esperanto language studies. Although technically Esperanto wasn't an official requirement for promotion, officers were generally expected to be reasonably fluent in the international language. La magno esta bonega mian gorain gratulon a la corinisto. Rimmer snapped his fingers. I would like to purchase the orange inflatable beach ball and that small bucket and spade. The meal was splendid, the woman translated. My heartiest congratulations to the chef. Rimmer squeaked. Is it? He asked the vid to pause. You've been studying Esperanto for eight years, Rimmer. How come you're so hopeless? Oh, really? And how many books have you read in your entire life? The same number as Champion the Wonder Horse? Zero. I've read books, lied Lister. We're not talking about books where the main character is a dog called Ben. Not books with five cardboard pages, three words a page, and a guarantee on the back which says this book is waterproof and chewable. Lister sprayed some WD-40 onto a spark plug. I went to our college. You? Yeah. How did you get into our college? Usual way. The usual, normal, usual way you get into our college. I failed all my exams and I applied. They snapped me up. Did you get a degree? Rimmer's pulse quickened. Please, God, don't let him have a degree. Nah, dropped out. Wasn't there long. How long? Lister looked up and tried to work it out. Ninety-seven minutes. I thought it'd be a good sky, but I took one look at the timetable and checked out. It was ridiculous. I had lectures first thing in the middle of the afternoon. Half past two every day. Who's together by then? You can still taste the toothpaste. He shuddered at the memory and went back to cleaning his bike parts. Rimmer shook his head and restarted the language tape. Le menuo aspectas bonege. Mi provas la coquinanion. Ah, uh, now this one I do know. Holly's image replaced the woman on the monitor and smoothly delivered the correct reply. 
The menu looks excellent. I'll try the chicken. Holly, as the Esperantinos would say, Rimmer made the Ionian sign for Smeg off with his two thumbs. Bono verba al sendi la portiston lorosens estas rano e mia bideo. And I think we all know what that means. Yes, said Holly. It means, could you send up the hall porter? There appears to be a frog in my bidet. Does it? Rimmer was genuinely surprised. Well, um, what's that one, uh, your father was a baboon's rump and your mother spent most of her life with her pants round her ankles up against walls with astros? Look, said Holly, suddenly remembering why he was there. You'd better come down to the communication suite. We're getting an SOS call. And with that exciting news, we come to an end of the final chapter of this video. Thank you very much for joining me, everyone. So we have Holly lost in space, Rimmer trying to learn Esperanto, that international language that never actually took off. Anyone remember that? And Lister wondering where he's going to get a pair of babies, and perhaps this ship full of women that we've just heard about, and an SOS call suddenly received in deep space, Perhaps we're going to find something to solve that problem. There have been so many like fun like sci-fi jokes and ideas in this episode. I'd love to hear which ones you liked. The ads being made by creating supernova stars throughout the galaxy. That was quite amazing. What do you guys think? Um, the cats reading books by smelling was very fun. And then other smells like translating into words was quite interesting. And now we've come to an end of the whole speculative science fiction around travelling beyond light speed. How did you feel that that was? Um, I'm not sure whether we have Neil deGrasse Tyson listening to uh, the audiobooks, but anyone out there who knows their science or is just interested, let me know your thoughts. As ever, guys, thank you so much for listening. Please like this video if you've enjoyed it. If you've enjoyed it and you know someone else will enjoy it, please share it with them. And if you're not, but I imagine many of you already are, please do subscribe to the channel and listen out for more audiobooks and live streams every week. I'll see you tomorrow for Star Wars Red Harvest, the next episode. And um, in the meantime, please remember, we are all Fulcrum. <laughs>